Hi, everyone. Happy Friday. Uh, welcome to our training today. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Alexis Alvarez, and I'm the Director of Statewide Training here at Florida Legal Services. I appreciate you all joining me on a Friday. I appreciate our speaker joining us here on a Friday. And I am so amped to talk to you all about the topic that we're presenting today. Uh, the topic is going to be AI, AI ethics, um, or as, as titled, Don't Be a Dummy About AI. Um, and this presentation is really going to focus on the um, ethical opinions and ethical circumstances out there nationally and in Florida that have happened as AI has kind of permeated our legal practice. Um, but also the you know more important goal uh, of this presentation is to teach you how to be smart about the use of AI, how to not lag behind by not using AI, and how to incorporate AI um, ethically and practically within your law practice. So really excited to have you here. I'm going to go through some housekeeping announcements before I do a quick introduction and then we get into the content. Um, but for housekeeping announcements, this is being recorded. A copy of the recording will be sent to everyone who registered. That recording will come in an email from Zoom. If you don't get it, don't worry. Email me. I'm going to pop my email into the chat. I'll help you with anything you need. Second piece of housekeeping announcements uh, would be CLE credit. This was approved for CLE credit and a bunch of them. Uh, general CLE, tech CLE, ethics CLE. And so at the end of this presentation, I will put that CLE code into the chat and also um, announce it out loud. But don't worry, you will also get that CLE code with the recording in that email that I mentioned earlier uh, that will come to your inbox via Zoom in 24 hours. Final piece of housekeeping announcements to go through are questions and answers. Um, please don't be shy. This is a really cool topic um, and it's cutting edge and it's it's evolving. So if you have any questions, please drop them into the chat or the Q&A and we'll do our best depending on how much time we have to answer them towards the end. Our speaker is an, an incredible friend to legal aid and really just someone who's dedicated a lot to uh, giving back to the legal aid community. I, I think he might answer some questions uh, if, if you need those questions answered. So um, with that being said, enough of the boring stuff. I'm going to introduce you to our speaker here today, Robert Bonner, who I've worked with on a few other um, presentations in the statewide training initiative and hopefully can wrangle him into a few more going forward because he's really amazing. Um, Robert, I call him Bob if I'm 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 uh, pausing there. Please Robert, do. <laughs> I knew you were going to say that. Bob is board certified uh, by the Florida Bar and the National Board of Trial Advocates. He practiced in Florida for 41 years as a civil trial lawyer in both state and federal court. Um, in August of 2022, Bob transitioned after he retired from the Florida Bar uh, to Barry University School of Law, working as an assistant professor where he teaches civ pro, civil pro, um, trial ad, motions and depots, and faculty as a faculty director, excuse me, of the externship program. So. I, again, am so thankful to have you here, Bob. I always love learning from you. Thank you so much uh, for all that you are, are juggling at Barry and all that you're doing for law students. And thank you for giving us some uh, time to learn from you and gather some of your expertise. So if you want to pull Thanks. up the presentation, you got it. <laughs> Glad to help out anytime. Uh, let me uh, get started here with the uh, presentation. We pull up the Looks good. PowerPoint screen. I do not claim to be an expert about technology. I do not claim to be an expert about chat GPT. I do not claim to be an expert about a whole lot of things. But what I do know is that chat GPT can be a very valuable tool for lawyers. It can be a very, very valuable tool, but there's also a lot of pitfalls associated with it. We're going to take a look at some of those pitfalls today and what various courts and bar associations have done to deal with those. Think back a little less than a year ago, June of 2023, we first heard about chat GPT becoming an issue. Back then, there was a U.S. district judge who sanctioned two lawyers for submitting a brief written with chat GPT. Now there's no problem with using your brief uh, or using chat to help write your brief. The problem is chat came up with cases that didn't exist. 
and those lawyers cited those cases. The brief contained citations to non-existent cases. Now, as lawyers, we should all know, always read a case before you cite it in a brief. These lawyers didn't do that. They said, oh, chat came up with this case. Hey, it looks good. We're going to go ahead and go with this. Not a good idea. Uh, they were sanctioned for making false and misleading statements about the brief after the opposition's lawyers raised concern that the brief was from court cases that didn't exist. And rather than fall on their sword and take the blame, they compounded the error. They said, oh, well, you know, we had some associate write this. We had no involvement. If you put your signature on something, it is yours. It is your problem. It is your obligation to make sure it complies. We have rules, gatekeeping rules, for lawyers to ensure the accuracy of their filings. There are rules in the rules of judicial administration about what it means when you have your signature on a document. Those rules are there for a reason. We have Florida statute section 57105 that puts obligations on you. That is there for a reason. In federal court, we have rule 11. That is there for a reason. And if you start putting things in your filings that are just flat out creations of chat's imagination, that's not a good plan. You will end up becoming a warning for others like these lawyers did. But the fact that these lawyers got dragged through the legal community wasn't the end of it. In November of 2023, we had another instance of lawyers using chat to write pleadings. In that case, a disciplinary judge approved of a Colorado lawyer's suspension for using chat GPT that generated fake cases. Again, read the cases before you cite them. Don't just rely on things that artificial intelligence comes up with for you. The lawyer submitted the motion drafted during, during using chat. He looked at the motion, he looked at the citations, he didn't read them, but he thought they were garbage. And despite the fact he thought they were garbage, he submitted the motion anyway. Not a good plan. Uh, then when he got to the hearing, rather than take the blame, which would be the right thing to do, he blamed it on an intern who made a mistake. It doesn't matter if it is an intern, a paralegal, or anyone else. As lawyers, we have an ethical obligation to supervise everyone who is working under us. It is the lawyer's ultimate responsibility. So the Colorado has an Office of Attorney Regulation. They said that he violated his professional duties, the duties to act competently, diligently, and with honesty. He violated those obligations. He got a two-year suspension. He had to serve 90 days of that suspension. And then he had the balance of those two years on probation. And if he messes up on probation, there will be worse sanctions. Shortly after that, in December of 2023, we have yet another example of somebody foolishly relying on chat GPT. Michael Cohen, whose name has been in the media for ever, it seems, back 2016, he gave his lawyer fraudulent case citations that were generated for him by AI with respect to a motion that was going to be filed to end his probation, to end his supervision. U.S. District Court judge found three case citations. He was concerned about them because they were in the motion to end supervised release. He gave his lawyer these fake citations because he used Google Bard. Google Bard is a generative AI software program. He did not know that Google Bard was a generative tech service. He thought, allegedly he thought, that Google Bard was just like doing a Google search. He said, well, the citations look real. That's the problem with using artificial intelligence. They may look real, but they may not be real. You've got to, once again, read the cases. Then earlier this year, in January, we've got another train wreck. Lawyers using chat, using AI without fulfilling their ethical duties. 
in this latest episode, the Second Circuit is looking to sanction a lawyer for fake citations in an appellate brief. Never a good idea. The lawyer submitted a brief using fake cases generated by chat and did not read the case and did not check the brief to catch the mistake. The lawyer was referred to the Second Circuit's grievance panel. Little known fact, federal courts have their own disciplinary bodies that are separate and apart from state bar disciplinary bodies. You can be disciplined by a federal court even before you get the disciplinary notice from the Florida bar. Not good. The court was concerned that the lawyer made no inquiry into the validity of the sites, despite the fact that they have Rule 11 in federal court. And there are ethical obligations for lawyers with respect to the things they submit to the court. Again, you don't want to be the cautionary tale. You don't want to be the lawyer who's on above the law or any of the other legal blogs being dragged by your fellow attorneys over the Internet. You don't want to be the lawyer who's being discussed in continuing legal education meetings about what you should never do. Don't let this happen to you. You need to be smarter than this. So first thing, what is AI? What is AI? There are two categories of AI platforms. There are closed models and there are open models. Again, I don't claim to be an expert about AI. I just know what I've been able to research in preparing for this presentation. The closed models are ones where the platform does not use your information to train itself. There may be less of a problem with attorney-client confidentiality if you are using a closed model because it's not going to be using a vacuum to suck all of the confidential client information into its database and then making it available for the rest of the world. Closed models do not disclose your information to third parties who use the platform. Again, you have a better opportunity to keep your material confidential if you used a closed AI platform. They are safe. They are safer, I should say, when it comes to confidential information, proprietary information, trade secret information, protected healthcare information, and other types of confidential privileged information and data. Open models are where a lot of the ethical issues come in that are separate apart from the AI making up cases that don't exist because the open models take all of the data, all of the material that you upload, and it becomes part of their thinking process, and it becomes accessible and available to everyone else who uses it. They use your prompts for training, and they can use your information from your prompts in response to other prompts that lawyers who use the system use. If you go to chat GPT, that is an open AI model. If you look at the terms and conditions of chat GPT, you will see that it is able to use the information that you submit and incorporate it into its training to incorporate its prompts into the material that it's in its database and that other people will have access to it. This is a serious ethical concern for confidential client information, a serious ethical concern for proprietary information and protected healthcare information. Again, chat GPT is an open AI model. We also have generative pre-trained transformation types of uh, models, the chat GPT, generative pre-trained transformative. Generative pre-trained transformers GPT our type of large language model. This is chat GPT. Have any of you used chat in your practice? If you're not using chat, you probably ought to consider it at the very least because there are so many wonderful things chat can do for you in your practice. So many things. You can use it for marketing. Now, most of you are in the, uh, sector where you're providing legal services. If you leave uh, that sector and go into a private practice for profit, you're going to need to market. And chat can help you develop marketing materials. Uh, 
you can use chat to draft and revise copy for bios, newsletters, blast emails, social media posts with respect to marketing. As lawyers who are involved in litigation, you should all know the importance of having a case theme. Every case needs a good theme. You need to have a hook to rope in the jury to your case. Chat is an excellent way to develop a theme for your case. If you don't have experience in developing case themes, this can be a bonanza for you in developing a theme for your case moving forward. You can use chat to prepare for depositions. You can use chat to develop an outline of questions for your depositions, to develop a game plan for your depositions. Again, this is a valuable tool for both young lawyers who aren't experienced and for more experienced lawyers as well, because we can all use a little bit of help along the way. Deposition outlines are an excellent use of chat GPT. Closing arguments. We did not have chat to help us draft closing arguments when I was practicing law, but chat is a great way to develop closing argument. When I was teaching trial advocacy last summer, we were using a wrongful death case as our case model. And on the class where we were doing closing argument practice, one of the students, the first student who represented the plaintiff who got up and gave a closing, never talked about damages and never asked for money, which is kind of important when you're in a civil case where the only remedy is an award of money damages. And I asked her why she didn't do that. She said, I didn't know how. I said, do you have access to chat GPT? She said, yes. Why don't you type in wrongful death, closing argument, death of a minor child, how to ask for money damages, how to argue damages. And she did. And within a matter of seconds, she had a great damages section for her closing argument, including the ask for the money a great way to develop a closing argument. Legal writing, again, notwithstanding the fact that chat has been known to create fake citations, chat and other AI platforms can help you with your legal writing. You just have to make sure to check and make sure that citations are real. Pull the copies that chat puts together for you read the cases and make sure that it is correct before you submit it to the court. The uses of artificial intelligence in your practice are limited only by your imagination and by the constraints of the rules of professional responsibility. So the question then becomes, how are you going to use chat ethically? How are you going to use artificial intelligence in your practice and not get sideways with the Florida bar or with a federal court disciplinary committee. The courts have started taking a look at this and a lot of court systems are becoming proactive. Shortly after we had the first court order sanctioning lawyers for using chat and submitting non-existing cases, some of the district courts and some of the judges in different district courts came up with orders specifically related to their courtrooms. In the Northern District of Texas, uh, one of the very first ones was Judge Starr of the U.S. District Court for the Northern District of Texas. He was the very first to issue a standing order on the use of artificial intelligence. His standing order obligated lawyers and pro se litigants to file a certification declaring whether any portion of their filing would be drafted using generative AI. So if you were practicing in his courtroom, you actually had to certify that you were using AI in the document. And I'll guarantee you that if you did, you were going to get a heightened sense of scrutiny from Judge Starr in his courtroom. Lawyers had to certify that either none of the content was drafted using generative AI or that generative AI would be verified for accuracy by an actual living, breathing human being, such as the lawyer who submitted it. Imagine that, requiring a lawyer to actually read something and understand it and make sure it's true before submitting it to the court. 
Shortly thereafter, the Eastern District of Pennsylvania got in on the act. And Judge Bailson of the Eastern District issued a similar order requiring lawyers and pro se parties to disclose the use of AI in drafting their court filings. The standing order did not limit the scope to only generative AI. Judge Starr's order in the Northern District of Texas was limited to generative AI. Judge Bailson's order was not. Judge Bailson's order included machine learning. Machine learning included the closed AI. Then the Northern District of Illinois got in on the act. Again, going back to Judge Bailson, using generative AI to conduct legal research or draft documents, had to disclose the specific tool and the manner in which it was used. Eastern District of Michigan, Northern District of California got in on the act. The District of Hawaii got in on the act. Eastern District of Missouri got in on the act. We can see that the steamroll effect is going on here as it goes through the federal court system with a lot of judges being proactive with respect to the use of artificial intelligence in court filings. The District of New Jersey, similarly. Southern District of New York. Southern District of Ohio. Eastern District of Oklahoma. Western District of Oklahoma. Fifth Circuit Court of Appeals. Now, Florida courts started coming up with their own concerns about AI. And the Florida Supreme Court commissioned a group to get together to try to address some of the concerns surrounding the use of AI in the legal profession. As is often the case, what happens, a committee is created. And this time it was called a special committee on AI tools and resources, a group of lawyers who are members of the Florida Bar. They were put together and asked to draft up some sort of paper that set forth the concerns and possible ethical uh, responses to them. This ultimately resulted in the issuance of Advisory Opinion 24-1. As you know, the Florida Bar occasionally issues advisory ethical opinions, and this was the very first advisory opinion of this year. Under the advisory opinion, the Florida Bar says a lawyer can ethically utilize generative AI, open AI, but only to the extent that a lawyer can reasonably guarantee compliance with the lawyer's ethical obligations. You've got to mind your P's and Q's with respect to your ethics. There is no doubt that you can use generative AI in the practice of law as long as you do it ethically. In doing that, you have an obligation to protect the confidential confidentiality, boy, it's been a long week, of client information. We all have the responsibility to respect and protect attorney-client information. And one of the concerns about using an open AI is if you upload confidential client information, it's going to be out there for the whole world to see. You've got to protect it. You have to provide accurate and competent services, obviously, as a member of the bar, and avoid improper billing practices. Comply with applicable restrictions on lawyer advertising. Again, concerns for all aspects of the practice of law, not just using artificial intelligence. So let's talk a little bit about confidentiality. Confidentiality is one of the touchstones of the attorney-client relationship. Without confidentiality, our clients would not be candid with us. Without confidentiality, we could not be candid with our clients. Attorney-client confidentiality is essential to full and complete representation of the client. Because of this, under 24-1, it is important that you get the client's information. You get the client's informed consent. Get the blessing of the client before utilizing a third-party AI if the use of the AI could involve disclosure of any confidential information. Have a conversation with your client. 
let the client know the risks of using this generative AI program. Let your client know the benefits of using the generative AI program and make sure that your client makes an informed decision regarding the use of the generative AI program. Use of a self-learning generative AI program has the inherent risk that the client's information is going to be sucked into the system, into the database, stored there, and revealed in response to future inquiries by third parties. So you need to think about, are there ways to get important factual information into the AI system that don't disclose your client's identity, that doesn't disclose confidential attorney-client information? Can you do it in a way that is generic and still get the results from it? If you use an in-house generative AI, rather than an outside generative AI, you may be able to alleviate those confidentiality concerns because on the outside generative AI, your data is hosted and stored by a third party. And once it is hosted and stored by that third party, it is there for the rest of the world. And you are in a world of trouble. If the use of the generative AI does not involve disclosure of confidential attorney-client information, you are not obligated to get the client's informed consent. But if it does, you are. So let's talk a little bit about oversight of generative AI. How is your organization, how is your practice going to oversee the use of generative AI in the practice? You need to have a policy. And opinion 24.1 says that a lawyer must, that's mandatory, it must make reasonable efforts to ensure that the law firm has policies to reasonably assure that the use of generative AI is compatible with the lawyer's own professional obligations. There needs to be a policy. The lawyer has to review the work product of the AI in situations similar to those that require you to review the work of non-lawyer assistants like paralegals, law clerks, or even the work of associates. You have got an ethical obligation to review the work product of people who are working for you, even when those people are not actual living, breathing human beings, but are instead some form of artificial intelligence. You can't just go submitting these things without taking a close look at it with strict scrutiny as to whether the things submitted are actually true. At the end of the day, you as lawyers are ultimately responsible for the work product, regardless of whether it's something you create or whether it's something that was done by a non-lawyer like a paralegal or by a non-human like artificial intelligence. It's your license that's on the line, not the license of a paralegal not the license of a computer. It is your license as a lawyer, so you are responsible for making sure that it is compliant with all the rules of procedure and professional responsibility. Because of this, it's on your shoulders to verify the accuracy of the research, the sufficiency of the research, all the work done by your generative AI. You are the person who is responsible. You are the person whose license is on the line. You need to review it for accuracy. You need to review it to make sure that it's real. If you don't, you can have a violation of your duties of competence, 4-1.1. You don't want to be going to a grievance committee and being prosecuted by the grievance committee and ultimately the Florida bar because you didn't do these things that are simple enough to do. You do not want to be in that predicament. You also don't want to be involved in, oh, I don't know, submitting frivolous claims and contentions, which is rule 4-3.1 and also under 57.105 of the Florida statutes. You do not want to be that lawyer. Although, 
from my standpoint, if you are, I'm sure that you'll make a wonderful example for my civil procedure classes going forward. You have a duty of candor to the tribunal, truthfulness to others. These are all obligations you have that can be violated if you do not check up on the work that AI does for you. You can be sanctioned. You can be sanctioned by the court. You can be sued by your client for malpractice. You do not want to be in either of those buckets. You don't want to be getting sanctioned. You don't want to be getting sued. Not a good thing. Because of that, you need to think long and hard about the types of things you can delegate to a generative AI system. Is this something that is going to compromise my ethical and legal obligations? How can I keep this from compromising my ethical and my legal obligations? A little bit about legal fees and costs. And I realize most of you aren't in a situation where fees and costs may be an issue, but the bar has concerns about generative AI and its implications with respect to legal fees and costs. Because generative AI may produce the work more quickly and more efficiently than a lawyer could, the bar does not want lawyers billing for the same old rate that they would have done the work if they did it themselves. The bar doesn't want that. The bar doesn't say, oh, it's okay. It would cost you the client X number of dollars, X number of hours to have this done by a lawyer. So it's okay for you to pay the same amount for something done in one tenth of the time by generative AI. You can't do that. Cannot do that. You cannot bill for the time it takes AI to do something. You can bill for the lawyer time, but not the AI time. You need to inform your client in writing, preferably, of your intent to charge a client the actual cost of using generative AI. When I was in private practice, we would routinely use Westlaw to do legal research. And we would let the clients know. Many clients did not feel we should bill them for the cost that we were charged by Westlaw for using the research time. Uh, their theory was you can go to the law library at the public library and do this research too. Just bill us for the lawyer time, which is fair. You can, however, upon agreement with the client, bill them whatever cost you have for using the AI. AI. Is there an hourly charge for using it? Is there a per minute charge for using it? I don't know because I don't use it yet. But if there is a charge and you can get the client to agree in writing to having that charge passed on, then by all means do it. So how are you going to handle these things? So, number one, with respect to AI, unless your organization has a written policy, stop. Stop right now, drop everything, do not do anything with respect to AI unless your organization has a written policy, because otherwise it is going to be one colossal mess and the floor to bar will not be happy with you. Tell everyone in your organization or go to whoever runs your organization, the leader of your organization, the CEO, the senior member, whoever needs to say until further notice, no one can use AI for any client or firm matters because without a policy, you are asking for trouble. You need to have a policy. Cease and desist until you have a policy. Because of that, once you have ground everything to a halt, your next task is to develop a written policy. Not just a verbal policy that can get misunderstood. Your organization has to have a written policy with respect to the use of AI. Do what the bar did, create an AI committee, appoint someone to lead it, choose committee members, 
have them work together to evaluate which AI platforms to use and how they should be used. Committees are good at doing these things. You need to put together a committee to figure out how to do these things. The committee should evaluate the various AI models and how they might be used by your organization. Is this the best type of AI for our organization? Are there better types of AI that may be less intrusive with respect to attorney-client information? Are there forms that are less likely to compromise confidential information? These are all important things to consider. Once that is done, your committee needs to prepare a written policy spelling out how your organization should use AI. You need to get it in writing. I can't emphasize that enough. What should the policy contain? The policy should state the platform or platforms your organization will be using. The policy should state in specific detail what you can use them for and what tasks you can perform while using them. There should not be anything left to guesswork. It should be specific, it should be detailed. In addition to saying what you can use it for, the policy should indicate prohibited uses. The policy has to prohibit the use of other platforms that aren't approved, and the policy should describe tasks that are not to be used while using the approved platform. So you can't use these platforms, and even if you use an approved platform, you can't use AI for the following tasks. Your organization's written policy should take into account the issues addressed in Advisory Opinion 24-1. Read Opinion 24-1. Read some of the orders from the federal judges who have vilified people for using AI improperly. Your policy should consider the following. Confidentiality. Make sure that your client confidentiality is preserved. Your policy should consider and articulate oversight. How is the use of AI going to be supervised? How is it going to be overseen? Your policy should contain grounds and details about client consent a specific provision for client consent because you need to get your client's approval, your client's blessing to use this, and you probably ought to get it in writing. Your policy should contain provisions regarding competency because unless you have competency with respect to technology, you should not be using it. You need to have competency. You should have training for your people with respect to the use of AI so that they can develop competency in using it in the provision of legal services. Do y'all have any questions or comments about this? And so um, folks, while you're thinking about putting your questions or comments into the chat or the Q and A, um, I have a question that I'm gonna ask. And I also want to let folks know that if you're more comfortable asking your question uh, like verbally, out loud, via audio, what you can do is you can raise your hand um, and, you know, Bob and I will look and I can take you off mute um, if you prefer to ask um, out loud. But so, you know, Bob, while I'm thinking about this, um, and actually, sorry, a question did come in from the chat, so I will go last. Um, the question in the chat says, do you have a sample procedure or policy for the use of AI or any that you would recommend? I do not. Uh, if you can send me an email to rbonner at barry, B-A-R-R-Y dot E-D-U, I can go find one and uh, send it and uh, also send it to Alexis so she can provide it to everyone. That would be awesome. Um, I popped your email into the chat and yeah, there's got to be some out there, right? Or can you, is, is, is this too... Um... 
like a, uh, what is the word I'm looking for? I'm, I'm not, it's, I'm blanking right now, but to ask AI to generate one for you. <laughs> I, I probably could, but I, I try to avoid that like the plague because I've got so much stuff on my hard drive. I don't want it being vacuumed into the uh, database. Yeah. Existential. That was the word I was looking for. Is it like highly existential to be like draft a policy on how I can control you? Um, or ironic would be another word. <laughs> or ironic. Um, another question came in. It said, uh, what is an example of closed AI? Uh, closed AI systems are those that do not share your information with the rest of the world. Uh, off the top of my noggin, I do not know the brand name of any of the closed AI systems. Uh, I'm only familiar with the the open AI systems. But uh, again, shoot me an email and I'll get that for you. Yeah, and I bet we could also Google it too and see there's probably some we don't even know about. You know, That's what I'm going to do. <laughs> yeah, because my understanding now, you know, I, I don't know if it was you who I was talking to when I was planning this or someone else, but like there's so much more than ChatGPT. And I'm I'm I only know about Chat ChatGPT, and apparently there are a lot, a lot, a lot have, that have popped up since uh, the popularity of ChatGPT. So. Well, for example, Westlaw uh, now has uh, yeah. AI uh, enhanced research, and uh, there are just you know, everybody's getting into the act. Uh, again, I try to avoid it, but yep, yep, yep. That's and because so I'm a dinosaur. <laughs> Well, listen, I, I am younger in the way I look, but I'm a dinosaur too in, in the way that I function. Um, I still like my legal pad. I still like to print stuff out. Not, I don't for, you know, environmental issues, but I do prefer it. <laughs> um, so folks, keep adding your questions into the chat. Uh, these are awesome. Um, I'm going to ask a question that I was thinking of, and it might be an annoying question, so I apologize. Um, I'm imagining the conversation with my client where I'm trying to get their consent to use AI. And I don't know how the conversation would go. I don't know exactly what I would say because, you know, again, I, I do come from a public defender background where you have clients that are a little hesitant in general that they're your client because you are technically paid by the state, even though you're fighting the state. So immediately, if you were to say, well, can I have your consent to use AI as part of our work? They're going to be like, why can't you do it yourself? Why is, you know, why aren't you good enough to do it yourself? And I think that's something too we experience in legal aid where, you know, there's this idea that because it's, you know, lower income, because we're serving a population that doesn't necessarily have to pay buku bucks to get the work, people, you know, often there's a misconception that there's a, a lower caliber of work, which is not true. But so you kind of get that with your clients sometime where you have to prove yourself, right? Prove what you're doing is right and it is the best. So not to ask you to role play, but what are some ways that that conversation can actually practically be had, especially with a population like ours, which is already a little um, hesitant sometimes about how we might go about things? Uh, you're referring to your, your typical client who their only concept of uh, artificial intelligence is watching yeah. the Terminator movies. <laughs> Probably that's another, that's another layer to it, right? Like yeah. they might not be familiar with AI the way we are, and that might be a difficult thing to breach with our, our population. So yes. I think the best way to start out would be to say that this is a valuable tool that can assist us in a, a number of ways uh, with respect to developing a case theme, jury, voir dire questions, opening statement, closing argument, and things of that nature. And it is not the be all and the end all. It is something that we use to supplement our own professional education, training, and experience. We will not input any of your confidential personal information. We will not input your name. We will not input your address, date of birth, social security uh, number, or anything else that is of a confidential personal identification nature. We may have to put in some facts, but we will try to put them in with respect to this particular situation in as generic a way as possible. We will not give the uh, date or location of the alleged incident. We will try to have everything be as generic as possible, but this is a valuable tool which will allow us to do an even better job of representing you. Yeah. How's that? That sounds wonderful to me and yeah, it. It makes me, you know, what, what you're saying made me think, you know, it, it really explaining to a client, this is not going to take away the role of a lawyer. I have my law degree that, you know, gives me these skills, gives me this ability that AI doesn't have. 
I don't I don't know if you remember this, but last spring when the AI was first you know, hitting the news, there was some company that claimed that they could have their AI argue a uh, motion or a trial and do better than a human being. And it never got going. It, it ended up being you know, a, something that was just a non-starter. <laughs> but you're not going to, at least hopefully for the next few years, to substitute robot uh, computers for human beings. You know, it takes a real human being to be able to persuade a judge and yeah. persuade a jury, not just uh, a computer augmented voice. Uh, you know, I won't do my Stephen Hawking voice imitation or anything like that, but a computer generated voice isn't going to do it. Uh, right. You've got to have the human element because lawyers who are in the courtroom know how to think on their feet and see when things aren't going right with yeah. the jury. They see the jurors who are sitting there with their arm crossed. They know that they need to do something different. They see the judge glaring down at them. A computer can't do that. Yeah. But the computer can help you uh, develop your case theme, your voir dire questions, your opening, your closing, your outlines for your witness questions. Right. Yeah, I, I agree with that. And, you know, I think the concept that, um, you know, that AI will replace us as lawyers. I don't I don't I don't buy that. I don't think that's going to be the case, especially for all the things that, that you are mentioning. Um, something that also I, I have thought about in the AI context, because I've used it here and there for little aspects in my work, is, I don't know if you've noticed this, uh, there is kind of a feeling of if you don't use it, you lose it, right? If you always turn to AI to write all your deposition questions initially, or, or to, you know, I do feel like it takes some of your creativity away. I feel like you have to have a really good balance of using AI and knowing when to say, okay, thank you for the starter or thank you for, you know, the clarification or thank you, but then kind of putting your own hat back on and challenging yourself, challenging yourself to, to bring your skills to the table. I don't know if you've experienced that. Well, because I don't use that, I haven't experienced it, but let's take the example that you gave of getting deposition questions from AI. If you are a good lawyer, you will always have some sort of basic outline framework for deposition, but it's not something where you read the questions verbatim and then move on to the next one on the list. You've got to listen to the answer because the answer may give you an idea for another 10 questions or 20 questions. You've got to be able to process the answer in real time and then follow that trail rather than just go down to the next question on the list. So it's not going to replace you in that regard either. Yeah, yeah, no, absolutely, you're right. Um, well, with that being said, let me check in the participants. Let me see if I don't see anyone raising their hand. A comment did come in through the chat that I wanna bring up um, just you know, for fodder, um, that um, apparently there was a uh, Florida Bar News article about a public defender apparently out of Miami um, using AI for research and case prep. And I believe the program they were using is called co-counsel. So just one, one to look at and see, um, this person said, not sure if it's open AI or anything, you know, specific, but definitely interesting. Yeah. So there you have it, everyone. Um, you know, you really a lot of practical tools and this is why I love trainings with you, Bob. They're just always so, um, focused on really, there is the academia aspect of it, but then it's also incredibly focused on, um, what to do in practice. And so I did just receive a hand raise. Do you still have a second, Bob? Oh, absolutely. Okay. Did it go down? Let me see. I can wait a few minutes to get out of my shirt and tie. <laughs> Let me see. Maybe it went down. Um, it was Paola. Were you trying to raise your hand? If you were, you know, please feel free to do it again because it went down. Okay, there we go. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to take you off mute, allow you to talk. And after the question and, and discussion, I'll remute you, okay? So you have the ability, Paola, to uh, mute. Oh, hi. Thank you for this informative uh, talk today. Do you have any suggestions for a primer like or, or a, a 101 on A1 uh, AI for folks? I don't because, again, 
number one, I'm not practicing anymore. I, I retired from the Florida bar July 1 of 2022. And number two, I have not used it. Uh, I think if you were to go on to Google and uh, try to uh, Google that question, you would probably get an answer every bit as fast or faster than I could Google it. Okay, thank you. Because I type with one finger. <laughs> Lies. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you so much for your question. I'm going to remute you now. Okay. All right. Well, with that being said, um, anyone else? Last takers on any questions? Okay. Thanks for the opportunity to share and uh, you know where to find me. Yes, Bob. Thank you so much. Okay. And very quickly, everybody, I've popped that CLE code into the chat. It's 8364, um, 8364, one general CLE, one ethics CLE, and one technology CLE. You all will get a recording with um, this recording and with a copy of that CLE code. As always, you can always reach out to me directly. I actually realized I did not put my email into the chat as promised, although you all know me by now. You know where to find me, Florida Legal Services, but uh, floridalegal.org. Alexis Bartholomew at floridalegal.org. So if you don't receive that email, uh, you have any questions, my email's in the chat, Bob's email's in the chat. Um, Bob, thank you so much. I love working hey, You're with quite you. welcome. Have a good day. <laughs> all right, everybody. Have a happy Friday. Great weekend. You all take care. Bye-bye.